You know, children are at the same time some of the greatest sources of joy you can have in your life and some of the greatest sources of anxiety you can have in your life. Uh, right now at our house, we are doing some work on the house, some things that needed to be done, and uh, in the process, there are, are things scattered about in other rooms while we work on where the rooms where the stuff needs to go. Uh, our youngest, Hope, uh, she's 16 months, right? There you go. 16 months, and uh, we got a bunch of stuff in her room, and there's a bunch of stuff in our room, and there's a bunch of stuff in, uh, in the dining room table. Um, and, uh, but the thing is, <coughs> uh, Hope, at her age, running all over the house, yesterday she was wearing a red shirt. Uh, it was actually, I think it was one of her brother's old shirts that came down like a dress. And she was proud of it because it had superheroes on it. And they always wear superhero shirts. Because it was red and she was moving so fast, uh, it looked like the flash. She was just zipping around the house. But the thing is, because of her age, she will go and she will just grab stuff if her door to her bedrooms have to be open. She'll go and grab some stuff out of there and drag it around the house. Or if our bedroom door happens to be open, she'll run in there, grab some stuff, and drag it around the house and throw it in a place it's not supposed to be. Where, you know, normally when everything is in order, everything's got its home and is sitting in its home and the cups are in their home and the cabinet and all this stuff. But uh, right now, with, every, with things in different places, they have a new home at the moment, but Hope will even take it from that and move it somewhere else. Well, yesterday I was looking for the dustpan. I'd swept up a little bit. She had been uh, Play-Doh happy and was uh, sweeping up a little section. And K- Katie swept up most of it, but I got a little bit of it. And I was looking for the dustpan, and I couldn't find it because I guess Hope sees us sweep. And so she'll take the dustpan like it's her little broom, and she'll run around the house with it. And we'll find it under the TV cabinet, or we'll find it in the boys' room, or we'll find it in the bathroom, or we'll find it in random places, or under the ottoman or something. And so I'm looking for this thing, and turns out she had taken it and thrown it somewhere. And uh, I think it was on top of her cup because that's where it goes. And so, I mean, it's, that's just where she is. She will grab it and go and run and do whatever. Uh, well, in a similar way, all kids are this way. You know, they, they have a phase where they will do something that makes complete sense to them, but doesn't really click with you. A few years ago, uh, before we had actually moved to DeQueen, before God had brought us to God's country, correct? Uh, we were, amen, there you go, all right. We were living somewhere else, and... Um, we had found some loose tiles in our shower, and we pulled them off and discovered some things that you don't want to discover in your shower. Uh, and so we had to, you know, fix all of that mess. And in the process, we decided to paint the bathroom. And uh, while we're doing this, Katie had found this really cool thing online of how to do the texture there in the bathroom. You do some paint, then you get some tissue paper, and you do some stuff, and then you paint on top of that. Well, this is some years ago, and our, our kids were considerably younger, and we had fewer of them back then. Uh, but one of them was about... Uh, I guess three three years old, and was watching Katie do the work, and and had the thought that he wanted to do it too, and so he he asked if he could help, and Katie said, "Yeah, go get your paint stuff in the kitchen, and come in here, and you can help me." And uh, well, he disappeared for some time, and Katie got a little worried. What's going on? And she said, uh, "Where are you?" And of course, Daddy was supposed to be watching, but Daddy was doing something else. Uh, I don't really remember, but. Uh, Katie walked into the kitchen, and I hear a yell, and this is what we discover. That's our kitchen wall. But I don't know, you can't really tell, but, but what's going on is there's paint, and there's tissue paper, and then there's paint on top of the tissue paper. He was observing what he saw in the bathroom and went and duplicated the same thing on the wall in the kitchen. Um, most of it came out. Uh, <laughs> But again, children are great sources of joy and great sources of anxiety at the same time. And and in the same vein, sometimes the littlest things cause the most damage. The littlest things cause the most damage. And we're going to look at that today in the Song of Solomon. If you'll open Bibles, if you brought them. If not, the scripture will be on the screens. It's also in your bulletin you got when you came in. And it's also in the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, all the scriptures there, the notes, as well as actually the discussion questions are in the Bible app, and a lot of other bonus stuff is there too. Uh, but Song of Solomon, some of your Bibles may call it the Song of Songs. We're going to be in chapter 2. Uh, you can use the Pew Bible there on the rack. It's on page 560 
in there. We're in the middle of a series that we're discussing relationships and uh, how to take our relationships from merely good to great. And there are principles that can be applied across every relationship. Uh, can, uh, the big one, which we're going to, uh, the example we're using today, marriage, but there's uh, friendships, there's relationships with your children, relationships with your parents, relationships with coworkers. Every relationship has certain similar aspects. And uh, that's what some of what we're going to look at today in the Song of Solomon, starting here in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look down and begin in verse 4. See, the Song of Solomon was written by Solomon, uh, and it is a, a, uh, uh, just a very short little uh, book that he wrote about himself and his relationship with a woman. Uh, there is some allegory here that can relate to God and humanity, but at the very basic level, the primary reason for its being written is the romantic love between Solomon and this woman that he's writing about. Uh, it's a great example, lots of good stuff in here, but what we're going to focus on today in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 2, verses 4 through 15, there are three sections in these verses we're going to look at. And these three sections uh, have three themes, and they can be applied to all of our relationships. Start in verse 4. This is the woman in the relationship she's speaking. She says, uh, speaking of the man, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. So he brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. This is a, a need for sustenance, a need for uh, uh, strength, the banqueting house where the food is, where you get your strength. Sustain me with raisins and apples. You need help getting stronger. But the, the phrase I want to focus on in those two verses is the last one in verse 4 where so, uh, it is written, uh, his banner over me was love. You know, back in the day when armies would go to war, there was a guy in the army whose job it was to carry a big pole that had a banner on it. And the banner was a declaration of the army that they were fighting for. Was the king symbol, was the, the, the national symbol or something along those lines. And that was the banner man and he carried the banner and it, it had a declaration of who uh, they were. And so that's the imagery here as this lady is speaking. She says, his banner over me is love. She is declaring that she is in a relationship with the guy, and it's love. It, that is the symbol. There is uh, no shame in her declaration of this relationship. She's proud of the fact. She is uh, joyous at the fact that they're in a relationship, and she wants everybody to know. That's why she's using the image of a banner. So she's waving it around. And uh, have you ever been around people like that who are in a relationship, and it's like they're waving their relationship in your face, and you're like, that is enough. I am going to block you on Facebook because I don't want to see one more post uh, of the 10 you've already posted today about how in love you are with the person you're with, and they, you know, got you the, you know, the grapes you like at Walmart or whatever, and, and they must be God sent because divine intervention, they bought you the grapes you like, or whatever. I mean, it's like the beginning of the relationship is this first section we're looking at. And this is the excitement level. This is the establishment of the relationship. The lady says that she is sick with love, not sick of love. There are some people like that, but she is sick with love. It is, it is changing her physical reaction to life because she is so in love. She is in this relationship. Look at verse 6. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. So again, remember this first section here, this is about the beginning of a relationship. And so we have here in verse 6 is a description of the closeness. There is a level of closeness in the relationship. Cradles my head, his uh, right hand embraces me, they are close, they are together. And then the speaker, this woman, gives a challenge to anyone observing the beginning of her relationship. In verse 7, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So in the midst of the beginning of her relationship, people observing, she says, don't awaken love until it's time. Don't let it get started until it, it needs to. Don't force the relationship. Now again, 
If you're in a relationship, this is an, an out to get out of the relationship, saying I need to remove myself from this scenario. This is before you even start. Don't go down that road. Don't force it. Allow it to happen. Allow God to bring you there. You know, before I became a pastor, I was a student minister, a youth minister. And in that process, there were many, many times that I had conversations with parents or with kids uh, as teenagers as they went through the life stage that they were going through and they're bombarded with images on TV, on their kids' TV shows of relationships that they need to be in. They need to have a best friend. They need to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's everywhere. So much so that it's even ingrained in parents sometimes. And parents project that at times on their children. I don't know if you know of anybody this is the case. I do. I can think of a specific instance, uh, several actually, where not only the parents force their kids into relationships when they definitely weren't ready, but those relationships developed and, and turned into marriage, and those marriage relationships combusted and destroyed everybody's life. And it all began because the parents forced something that it wasn't time to happen. And kids do this as well. They, they feel the need. They see it. They, they, they force the relationship when it's not time. I mean, I could throw stats at you after stats after you being a youth minister. I think it's 97 point something percent of relationships that happen before college don't go anywhere. And yet we Im, imbibe that as a culture, that it's something that needs to be uh, uh, fostered. And yet, I'm sure you teachers in the room can see it in the hallways, the devastation that that can cause at times when you start too soon, too early, begin before. Not only you're ready, but the relationship is ready. And so this woman here, in the midst of the beginning of her relationship uh, and the challenges that that comes with, she is saying to anyone who's watching, don't start until it's time. Don't start until you're ready. There's challenges you don't see coming. There's problems you don't see coming. There's going to be issues that you're not quite ready for. So don't force it if you don't have to. Look at verse 8. We enter into a new section here in verse 8. Uh, 4 through 7 that we just read. That was the beginning of the relationship. And now we see something new. Verse 8. The voice of my beloved... Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. Now, I'm sure every woman in the room who's married and you're sitting next to your husband, this is how you view your husband. He can, he can leap over mountains. He can bound over hills, leaping tall buildings in a single bound, faster than a speeding bullet. That's, that's how it is. Ask, ask Katie. That's how she views me. That, that is the truth. That is the gospel right there. Uh, this is what she says, behold he comes, leaping over mountains, bounding over hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. You see, what we see here in this guy, he's not a peeping Tom. This isn't weird. He's outside the courtyard. He's trying to get in to the, to the courtyard to, to get to the house, to get to his great love. He's actively pursuing the relationship. He's being intentional in what he's doing. And again, there's still a level of excitement. He's wanting to get there. He's doing everything he can. He will leap over mountains. He will bound over hills. He will go as hard uh, down the journey as he needs to go, no matter how difficult the path is, because he is actively pursuing the relationship. Verse 10, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past and the rain is over and gone. The winter is past. Now what's, what's interesting is the way that that's phrased. He's not necessarily saying the winter has passed, P-A-S-S-E-D, that we went through it, we made it through it. He says we're on the other side. It is in the past. We have passed the winter. It is gone. We don't need to think about it anymore. We don't need to dwell on it anymore because after winter comes spring. Spring brings growth. Spring brings blessing. So the rains have already passed. Rains are essential for growth, and the rains have happened, and now it's time for growth. Now it's time for blessing. The relationship has started. We're in the midst of it. It's time to grow and get stronger and be empowered by where we are in our relationship. 
And so this is a recognition of where the relationship truly is. It's not winter anymore. The, the dead season is gone. And now it is time to grow. Look at verse 12. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. So this is the relational springtime. Everything is growing. All this fruit is abundantly available. And and there is just goodness everywhere You look, and there should be in any relationship, there's a beginning period of the relationship, and then and and you get to the growth period, and everything should be aiming to grow. You should be growing individually in Christ, but also just as human beings. And the thing is, if you are growing in Jesus, if you are growing towards Jesus as an individual, then naturally the two of you will be growing closer together because if Christ is here and the two of you are growing towards him, you are growing closer to each other as you grow closer to him. And so the growth is happening. Flowers appear. The time of singing has come. The fig tree ripens. You may have never had figs. I had figs for the first time a couple weeks ago, and they are amazing. Somebody came to my office and uh, brought figs that were picked off of the tree, not 10 minutes before. Uh, they are amazing. You've got to try them. If you see a fig tree on the side of the road, stop and pick one and eat it. Uh, make sure it's a fig, though, because you might end up with something else in your mouth. But it is really, really good. And so that's the demonstration here. These are all good fruits. These are all good things that are happening. Vines are in blossom. The uh, fragrance, the, the, the sweet smell of uh, spring is happening. Look at the rest of verse 13. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. So growth, growing. You see, relational growth, though, is a two-way street. We see that both parties in this relationship are wanting the growth. They are striving for it. They're actively pursuing it. In a relationship, as being compared here to this garden, uh, there are two things that the garden needs, two things that plants need to grow. They need water and they need sunshine. And whatever your role is in the relationship, are you doing what you are supposed to be doing? If you're supposed to be watering, are you watering? If you're supposed to be providing the sunshine, are you providing the sunshine? Are you doing your part? You say, but the other person is not doing their part. That's not your concern at the moment. You've got to get you right before God can, can deal with that. If you're not right, why are you pointing your finger over there? Get you right. Be watering. Be providing the sunshine. Be the, giving the nourishment to the relationship. You need to be giving to the relationship, and you will experience a greatness in your relationship that God designed it to have. You know, but the thing is, every relationship can have the beginning point, can have the growth point, but every relationship, any relationship, will face challenges, especially God-honoring relationships. You see, in any relationship, you have the human component, and you're both human, and humans are sinful, and humans have problems, and humans have issues. And so those issues will clash and there will be problems in that relationship, challenges that arise. But in a God-honoring relationship, not only do you have hum, uh, human issues, you have an enemy of good relationships who's also fighting to tear apart the unity that God desires to be there. And so you have this other component, this, this, this other element that's trying to mess up the relationship, this supernatural element, Satan, who's trying to destroy the relationship. And so now you're not just fighting your own human selfishness, you're fighting an enemy you can't even see. So there will be any challenges in God honoring relationships, any number of challenges. And that's where we get to the third section that we're going to read today. We had the starting point, we had the growth point, and now we get to the protection. Verse 15 Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes. That spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Catch the foxes. You see, what's essential in relationships? You have these foxes who come into the garden of your relationship, into the vineyards, and they spoil it and they destroy it. 
uh, you've got to seal the cracks that allow the, those foxes in. You've got to seal the cracks, ideally seal the cracks together, and that saves the relationship. You've got to be in the same mind that you're both pursuing growth, both pursuing Christ, and, and seal those cracks. But the thing is about these foxes, these foxes are influences and temptations that seek to destroy the relationship. The foxes, these little foxes, it says. Now, I like that Solomon uses that phrase, little foxes. You see, if there's something in your relationship that's big and huge and it's a problem, you know it's there and and you can address the big problems. But it's the little problems that develop into big ones. That if you can stop it when it's little, it will never become big. If you can seal that gate off before the problem escalates, you can experience greatness in your relationship. Because all big problems start as little ones. If you see an enemy coming who's a giant, you're not going to let him in. But if that enemy sneaks in to a crack in your defenses and then grows already inside, it may be too late before you realize he's even there. Which is why the verse says, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes. You know, we have uh, at our house a little dog. And uh, this dog is about ten and a half years old. Uh, her, na- her name is Abby. And uh, Abby is a half dachshund, half Pomeranian. Now try to imagine that mix. But as a good-looking dog, smart dog, uh, all this, and we've loved having her. She's great around kids. Uh, but Abby runs in the backyard, plays in the backyard, plays with the kids, has a great time. Well, one day, Abby had been in the backyard, and I hear a funny noise at the front door. And so I go over there, the front door, and there's the dog on the front porch. And kind of confused, not really realizing what's going on here. So let the dog in the house, and she wants to go back outside, let her outside. And a few minutes pass, and I hear a noise out in the front yard. So it's not the front door now, it's in the front yard. So I go and open the front door, and there's the dog in the front yard, running around, chasing squirrels. So we let the dog back in the house and put the dog back in the backyard. And this time, no, I'm going to watch the dog. So the dog runs around the backyard and runs over to the west side of the house, you got to understand something. At our house, on the west side, where the fence is, we have a double fence, or double gate, so the mower can get into the backyard. And uh, it hadn't been an issue. I never realized it was that much of an issue. I'd mow and open the gate and get the mower in there, and when I finished, close the gate. Uh, but where the gates meet, through the shifting of the soil or something or whatnot, or maybe the dog didn't realize it until we'd been here for three years, but uh, there is a gap where the gates meet right at the bottom, and the dog can fit through the gap. And that's what was happening. The dog was running in the backyard, going over there, uh, uh, squeezing through the gap at the base of the, two, the meeting of the two gates and running around the front yard. And so I watched the dog run over there, get through there. And this time, though, remember the first time the dog came to the door. Second time the dog played in the front yard. This time the dog just runs. And so in the moment, I decide it's more important to chase after the dog than to plug the hole. I mean, plugging the hole is important. You've got to take care of the hole. You've got to seal that deal. But for the moment, the most important thing is to catch the dog. Get the dog, put the dog in, and then I can plug the hole. You know, and our relationships are the same way. We can have issues. We can have little foxes that can sneak into gaps that we don't even know were there. The problem is, you know, sometimes we don't even know that they're there until it's too late. And then we don't even realize that we were the one who left the gate open and allowed the little fox to get in. The little fox of destruction. We've got to chase the fox down, the influence, the temptation, the issue. Catch it, and then we can plug the hole. Then we can seal it off. And one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest little foxes here that uh, are prevalent in almost every single relationship are little conversations that we have in our minds. You see, little conversations with ourselves about the other's need to improve is a little fox of destruction. We can have those little conversations, and, and we can be, they can be uh, in the place of actually talking to the person, but we would say, if you Put that dish in the dishwasher. Mm, you need to put the toilet seat down. You need to shut that door so the kid stops getting in that room. You need to put your shoes up out the Put your clothes in the laundry basket. Why is your wet towel on the floor? Why is your rag sitting in the drain of the shower? That makes no sense. 
And you can have these little arguments in yourselves, and you're talking about some perceived deficiencies you see in the other person, whether it's, these are all marriage examples. I mean, it could be something else entirely, some friendship relationship, some uh, with your kids. You have an argument in your mind with your kids or your parents. You can't believe your parent is doing such and such and so and so and making that comment on Facebook. Why would they say that? Why even have a Facebook if you're going to put that out there? And you can have these, these arguments in your mind about these things, about your coworkers. Heaven forbid you can have these arguments in your mind about somebody at church about your preacher. You can have all kinds of arguments about all kinds of things, about all kinds of people. But what those little conversations in your mind do, it just destroys what's there. You see, what happens uh, oftentimes is we will have these thoughts and they will build up and they will build up and they will compound on themselves and then they will explode out in a a, a spewing mannerism and we will uh, uh, just spew out our wrath on whoever happens to be around us about maybe those particular issues or about something else and it will just have built up and we will feel better because we have spewed it out onto somebody but the other person won't feel better. I've had a conversation with somebody before. He said, it's just, it's a, you just need to let somebody vent. Just let them air it out. And that may make them feel better, but the problem is when they air it out, they're spewing the wrath onto somebody else and affecting that person's outlook on life, on the person they're talking about, on their day. And what, what's even worse is when we have these little conversations, these little foxes with ourselves, there's no one to spew on but us. So we're spewing on us and regurgitating the whole mess, and we become even worse than we were before. The little conversations with ourselves about somebody else's perceived needs or perceived deficiencies, that's a little fox of destruction, and it will mess you up from the inside out. It will mess up your relationship. It will mess up your life. It will mess up your relationship with Jesus because it will become a a moldy, stanky piece of your soul. And you've got to address it. If you don't address it, then you're just going to pass it on maybe to your kids, maybe to somebody, another relationship. You've got to address the issue and get the mess out. Catch the fox. Seal the hole. Don't let that fox have any more access to you. Because those little conversations, those little arguments will turn you away from Jesus. You see, those little foxes have been strategically trained. Those little foxes of destruction have been strategically trained by the enemy of great relationships, Satan. He's been training these little foxes of influence and temptation for thousands of years. He has seen people with your personality and your drive and your motivation before in the course of human history. And he has been training these little foxes to sneak in and mess you up and and, and screw with your heart. That's where they want to get. These little foxes of influence and temptation and destruction want to get into your heart. But they get into your heart through your mind. Your mind is where they start. They start in your mind as you begin to think on these things, as you begin to have these thoughts. And the more you have the thoughts, the more you think on them, the more they take root and they seep down into your heart. And once they're there, it's hard to uproot them and remove them. That's when when negativity becomes bitterness, when it's taken root in your heart. And so you've got to catch them before they burrow their way down into your soul. You've got to catch them when they're just little foxes. In your mind. So don't be blind to your mind. You can go about your day and do a variety of things. You could be in the shower and just letting your mind wander. You can be at work and just let your mind wander. And you, 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 you creep into that stage of little conversations, little arguments about such and such and so and so and this issue that's going on. And that can develop into an, a, a running inner dialogue of complaint that has come into your mind. And at that moment, as you begin to let it percolate and ferment, it is slowly seeping down into your heart and taking root and messing you up. So don't be blind to your mind. You see, you must, (laughs) we're going to rhyme a lot. You've got to grind your mind to see what you find. 
You got to grind your mind. You got to got to search it. You got to search the, the 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 fences of your relationship and say, is this thing secure? Is this thing taken care of? Is this? Are there any gaps in my fence that would allow little foxes? In. Do I have any little pet peeves in my relationship that if that person in the relationship says that word or makes that statement about that political issue, that I'm going to just blow up and go off, and that's going to forever damage everything that Jesus had built up between us? you got to search the fence. Are there any little gaps for little foxes to get in and mess you up? If you want to be primed for a great relationship, not just a great relationship, but if you want to be primed for a great life, this is where it starts. Catch the little foxes. Because before you know it, if you allow them to come in, allow them to feed, they will destroy what God meant to be great. Your relationships and your life. And you see, the foundation of a great relationship is Jesus. Jesus is the example, the ultimate example of a great relationship. And we can never truly know a great relationship in this life if we don't first know Jesus. Because when we embrace that relationship with Jesus, then he sets the example of a relationship with anybody else. And so we have to start there. And to start a relationship with Jesus, you don't have to buy a cup of coffee. You don't have to click confirm or accept an invite on Facebook. You just have to believe That Jesus is God's son, that he came and he died, so that all your sins would be forgiven. He accepted punishment for your sins, and he died. And then he rose from that death so that you can live after death. If you want to live forever and have a relationship with Jesus and have him set the tone for every one of your future relationships, including the ones you have now, then you've got to believe in Jesus. And right now, some of you, I know some of you, need to make that decision. Some of you need to believe. Some of you have believed and haven't told anybody. Some of you are scared. And you're having right now in your mind a little conversation. Little foxes are sneaking in saying, nope, not today. I don't need to make that decision today. I know I need to go and, and I need to pray at, at the stairs about, I need to grab somebody and my friend whose our relationship has been damaged and we need to go and we need to pray. But you're having a little conversation saying, nope, because that person is going to think of me of this and that person is going to think of this and that person doesn't even know this and... You're, you're arguing with yourself and just doing untold damage. Stop having the little conversations. Seal that hole, seal that gap, and just act on what God has placed before your heart. And watch what God can do. So here's the challenge, all right? If you need to believe in Jesus or you need to let somebody know you believe in Jesus, come and do it in just a second. I'm going to pray. That's your instruction. After I pray, come and talk to me. Talk to Micah. We'll be down here. If you need to come and pray at the stairs, you do that. But the challenge is for the next week, as those little conversations begin to creep into your mind, shut them off. As the enemy starts to screw with your head, seal the hole. Because I guarantee you, if you interact with anybody today, those little conversations are going to start this afternoon. They're going to start this afternoon. Maybe you're watching the football game or or you're doing something and, and, and... Something happens and you begin to have that running inner dialogue and anticipating an argument or a discussion in your mind and you're allowing little foxes to creep in. Catch the fox, seal the hole. So for the next week, try it. I'm I'm letting you in on the enemy's battle plan, all right? He's not going to like it, so he's going to start messing with you. His battle plan when it comes to this issue is to let those little foxes in. So as those little foxes begin to come in, as those little conversations begin to percolate within your mind, cut them off. Shut it down. Seal the hole. Shut it. Maybe that's, that's your, that should have been the hashtag. Shut it down. Seal the hole. Everybody following you on social media will wonder what that's all about. And you can tell them. Shut it down. Seal the hole. And watch not just how your outlook on the week changes, but how your relationships this week develop and grow into what God intended them to be.